during the day. My name's Millie Chows, and I'm going to be your host today. I'm very honoured to be here um, for such an incredible project and such a, an amazing event, really, to celebrate the amazing work of fulfilling lives. Um, I'm a radio presenter, journalist, producer, uh, and I'm also someone in recovery uh, myself, long-term recovery. Um, so I guess the reason I'm here is because I have lived experience of multiple disadvantage, addiction, homelessness, uh, trauma, mental health challenges, uh, the criminal justice system. Um, so yeah, I had quite a, you know, a difficult, difficult uh, period in life. Uh, and I was fortunate, fortunate enough to uh, eventually, after kind of years in and out, falling between the cracks, kind of struggling um, to get my needs met, um, I was fortunate enough to uh, find my way into a trauma-informed gender responsive treatment centre called the Nelson Trust in Stroud, some of you may have heard of, um, where for the first time I sort of felt I could bring my whole self um, and I didn't have to kind of hide or edit certain parts of myself. And that was really transformative for me. Um, and yeah, I think that ties into a lot of the themes that we're going to be discussing today. So that's my connection to the subject matter. Um, and um, so, yeah, before we make a start, there's some amazing speakers and films uh, and performances for you today. But before we make a start, I just want to go through some housekeeping stuff. So we've got toilets just here. Uh, we have got the courtyard that I mentioned for sunbathing, but also for smoking. Um, if you if you want to smoke, that's where you go. Uh, there's a fire exit just here, these doors here. So if there was, in the event of fire, we'd just go out here. There's a car park and we'd be met by star. Hopefully that won't happen today. Um, we've got some filming taking place, as you can see. So if anyone here doesn't want to be uh, in any of the films or pictures, please um, make that known to uh, the CFE staff members. Um, uh, and we're also going to have some roving reporters who will be capturing sort of thoughts and reflections throughout the day. So if you'd like to share your thoughts and reflections, also make that known. Um, uh, so yeah, for those of you who don't already know, um, Fulfilling Lives has been an eight year investment from the National Lottery Commission. Um, uh, sorry, the National Lottery Community Fund uh, in 12 local partnerships across England. Uh, it's been going since 2014 and the programme has supported more than 4,000 um, people experiencing multiple forms of disadvantage, including homelessness, uh, alcohol and substance misuse, offending, mental ill health and domestic violence. Um, I was thinking about you know, the impact of that. And for each one of those individuals, as you know, we know um, people who work in this area or who have, you know, lived experience will know that, you know, when you're kind of facing these challenges, the ripple effect, you know, outward, you know, the, the families, the children, the friends, the colleagues, you know, that it affects, it's kind of immeasurable really. And the same goes for when someone makes overcomes those challenges and turns their life around and gets the support they need you know the positive ripple effect of that is incredible you know people who recover from these things go on not only to make amazing and fulfilling lives for themselves but the impact of that for their families for their children for their colleagues for their friends and something I've noticed as well um you know amongst you know my many friends and and colleagues in recovery is that often when people do recover, they have a really deep sense of wanting to change and make things better for other people. Um, and again, I think that really ties into the kind of spirit of what we're doing here today. Um, so we're going to hear that so much incredible work has been done and so much has been achieved. Um, but the issue of services working in isolation um, and people having a limited say in decisions that affect him affect them do remain. Um, the aim of today is that we're going to celebrate the achievements of fulfilling lives um, and to share the experiences and learning so that we can continue this work um, to support, uh, to work towards a system that is more collaborative, that offers a more coordinated and person-centred um, support that really meets people's needs and meets them where they're at. Um, so we have a really full agenda, busy day today. Um, we're going to be bringing you keynote speakers from the Fulfilling Lives Evaluation, 
uh, the National Lottery Community Fund and performances, poetry, films, workshop sessions and opportunities for you to network with each other uh, and colleagues and, and, and make new friends. Uh, we're absolutely delighted today that we're going to be joined by Kemi Badenoch, who's the MP, the Minister for Equalities uh, in local government, uh, faith and communities this afternoon. So please also feel free to tweet about your experience today uh, and any insights and learnings that you're taking using the hashtag see the full picture. Uh, so yeah, really looking forward to the day and um, I'm kind of getting ready to learn lots and be inspired and be moved. Um, uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce one example. So this is the first of two short films that we're going to see today. It's produced by Silverfish for the National Lottery Community Fund as a way to sort of capture people's stories and to demonstrate the impact that this programme has had on them personally and how it's contributed to their journey. It's been quite a rough ride. I was born in 1976. My mother got pregnant with me. She was she was ashamed. She was ashamed of me. She gave birth in in, in a flat with no gas, and no electricity on her own. She then hid me in a back room for about nine and a half months before the neighbours clicked on that she had a baby in there. She, she, she was beating me, starving me. We went alongside where um, I was born. It's the first time that I've been back for 45 years. <laughs> the first time that I started getting intoxicated, I was nine years old and somebody showed me how to sniff petrol. I was also drinking and so on. But when I got to third year, somebody showed me drugs, started showing me like cannabis, showed me mushrooms. I somersaulted into that world. I was self-medicating because of the um, scarring that I had from my childhood and what had gone on from abuse that I'd received. Because I wanted to grow dreads, my mother kicked me out. I was 15. I was homeless for 14 years when I first met Billy, who was my navigator for our Wi-Fi, which was also part of Touchstones and Evolving Door. I didn't trust Billy at all because it was services at first. It took him 20 years, built up a relationship with me that was solid. He worked with me and I managed to stop using drugs. I managed to get my alcoholism under control and then he put me forward to the NECG where I started working with um, Sean. Sean and Billy between them, the way that they worked with me was uh, very person-centered and it was a holistic approach towards me and so on. I was told that I'd be dead within six months or three specialists and so on. They got me back from there at that point when everybody else had just gone. They kept me alive, I owned life. At the end of the day, all my life. And the thing is, I don't know how I feel. I mean, I'm upset, but I've got to be strong because some of the things that I've told you and the things that I've done to myself and how I've coped with my beginnings and so on, I shouldn't really be here. <laughs> But I am, and the reason that I am here is to carry on supporting women that, that are uh, struggling with the kids on the ward. And I hope the story that I've, that I've told um, can give people hope, because <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still here. this work and and the importance of uh, relationships uh, and and what they what that you know these positive relationships can help um, 
people with. Um, so uh, then we have our first keynote speaker. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Dominic Williamson. Uh, Dominic is a consultant working with charities and local authorities to improve policy services and systems for people facing multiple disadvantage. He has over 30 years of experience working to tackle homelessness, substance use, trauma and reoffending, and he's going to talk to us about the changing context of multiple disadvantage over the recent years. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end, so please be thinking if there's anything you'd like to hear more about. Um, yeah, and here's Dominic. Can we have a round of applause for Dominic, please? Oh, gosh, that was... Uh... That was an amazing film. Um, just bear with, with me a second once I uh, get this. Thank you, Lily, and thanks to all of you for having me along today. It's really amazing to be together again, isn't it, after, uh, after so long. Um, here we go. Um, when, uh, when my daughter was very young, uh, she absolutely hated going for walks. And uh, this was a real pain because uh, very often we'd go to North Wales on holiday. And I love getting up into the mountains and uh, every time we wanted to get up into the Snowdonia National Park. So each time we did this, uh, my son would run ahead and my daughter would walk behind, stomping along with a proper face on. Uh, and it kind of took the joy out of it, to be honest. Uh, but one day she really surprised us and she ran ahead uh, and kept walking really fast. And when I tried to catch up with her, uh, she kept walking faster. Uh, and then eventually she turned around and she shouted at me, but if I'm ahead of you, you just can't see how miserable I am. Honestly, she totally hated it. So when two friends of mine uh, who have got daughters the same age, who are friends of Iris's, they suggested that we all go on a walk together. I asked Iris, uh, but I was convinced that she wouldn't want to do it. But she said yes. And we, uh, we went for a walk uh, on a place called Cadoridris. Uh, which is in the south of Snowdonia. Um, and uh, on a sunny day, we all set off. There we are, you can see us there. Uh, and I was totally convinced that we wouldn't make it to the top. No way. But as we went, something amazing happened. As we walked, she and her friends were just chatting and they didn't seem to notice that the, the distance was going past. On a particularly steep bit, one of her friends tripped over and bashed her knee and started saying that she didn't think she could do it. And that's when I noticed my daughter completely changing roles. Suddenly she was the one doing the encouraging and she was the one saying that we could make it to the top bit by bit. Uh, she was the one that was supporting her friend up the steep bits. And with Iris's encouragement, we did carry on and we made it to the top and the summit uh, there's an amazing, amazing view, uh, which is brilliant. But the best thing was that we achieved something that I was totally convinced uh, before we set out was impossible. And I guess that day reminds me of two truths that I think are important for us to reflect on today. And one of those is that we can often do things together that seem impossible on our own. And the other one is that when you do something, when you see somebody who you think is like you doing something, it makes you believe that you can do it too. So I wanted to tell that story uh, also because it's a bit of a metaphor. I'm gonna use the metaphor of a journey to think about the, uh, the, the Fulfilling Lives Programme. Because when, you're, when you walk around Cadder, you come back round and you get to this point where you can look back and you can see, you can see the route you've taken all the way up to the top up there. Uh, so you can see what you've achieved. So today we're taking, we're standing in the same metaphorical point, if you like, of the, of the fulfilling life journey, looking back on how far we've come and the route we've taken and what we've achieved. 
from up there, the people going up the path that you were up a few hours earlier looked like tiny ants. So I wanna look back and I want to celebrate and reflect on some of the learning that we've, uh, we've had over the last few years. And I also want to uh, acknowledge some of the people that have walked that journey with us. Uh, and we've achieved some amazing things. Uh, but when I look back to the start of the Fulfilling Lives journey, actually what we realize is that we didn't start at sea level. And the program was building on some really important lessons that we had taken in from the previous few years. And I want to just, I think it's important to try and understand those and see where the ideas that shape Fulfilling Lives came from. Now, this is my personal reflection on that. Other people will have a, a different view. And I may be a bit biased, uh, but looking back, I think one of the main, the early landmarks was the establishment of the Revolving Doors Agency back in 1993. Now, this was set up because there were growing concerns that the new approach to mental health in this country, which is called community uh, care in the community, was just not working for significant numbers of people who were getting caught in this revolving door of uh, prison, psychiatric hospital, and homelessness. The research and the insight that revolving doors undertook led to the development of the link worker model, which was established in 1997. And this approach has influenced many different models since, including the navigator model, which was became very prominent during the Fulfilling Lives uh, period. The fundamental difference about this model was that the worker was no longer tied to a particular place or service. They could go to where the client or the service user was, and they could work with them over a long term to build that relationship, which we heard in the film is so important. They could take time to build a trusted relationship and they could stay with the person for the longer term. And the goal was to work with them alongside them to empower them to access the different services that they needed to support their recovery. Now, around the same time, in the early 1990s, levels of rough sleeping were climbing very fast and campaigns by Shelter and others led to the government taking, uh, the, uh, taking action, which initially was the rough sleepers initiatives, uh, and the, uh, the, the Homeless Mentally Ill Initiative. Um, these created specialist supported housing and outreach teams working with people who experienced mental ill health who were on the streets. Then when Labour came to power in 1997, the key plank of their platform was the social exclusion agenda. This recognised that the, there's an overlap between people's needs and these could trap people in a vicious circle of harm. A new minister for social exclusion was created, uh, and at the first, at the launch of the social exclusion unit, the, the Prime Minister Tony Blair announced that rough sleeping would, would be one of their first goals. And we're now uh, in entering the new millennium. There we are, there's the dome down there. Um, alongside additional resources to tackle rough sleeping, the government also launched the Supporting People programme. This was a £1.8 billion programme channeled through local authorities to services to help sustain people with needs in their accommodation. And around this time, homelessness charities started to support, started to understand that the people that they were working with were facing that mix of needs, including drugs and alcohol problems, combined with poor mental health. And I want to pay particular tribute to the work of Pitt Bevan at National Homes Alliance at the time, now called Homeless Link, who led their multiple and complex needs project at this time. Pitt pulled together the growing evidence base and good practice from pioneering services across the country. And one of those uh, was here in Birmingham, not far from here at Lancaster Street, uh, run by Midland Heart. The government's focus on social exclusion was fertile ground for this thinking. And in 2006, the Minister for Social Exclusion was brought into the cabinet. A plan was published, reaching out, a plan for social exclusion. And there was a commitment in this to run a pilot, uh, adults facing chronic exclusion pilot, which ran from 2007 to 2010. So listen, we are now in 2007, things are looking really promising. We've got really good progress. We've got a commitment from government. We've got a pilot program. But when we look back on the horizon, there are some storm clouds gathering and we can hear the rumble of thunder. We better put our raincoats on because it's gonna get rough. 
At that time, I was working at Homeless Link and was seconded into the uh, Department of Communities and uh, Local Government to work on a new rough sleeping strategy. And we launched that by the, the minister launched that in uh, November 2008. In that very week, the storm of the global financial crisis became a hurricane and the stock markets across the world crashed. Fortunately, uh, the then CEO of Homeless Link, Jenny Edwards, understood that we needed to keep multiple and complex needs on the agenda. And together with Paul Farmer from Mind and other partners, uh, they, we established the Making Every Adult Matter Partnership. Uh, Ollie Hildley was appointed to head this up, and Ollie and his team have done an amazing job over the past 11 years supporting the programme and helping more than 30 uh, areas across the country with the MEME approach. Thank you, Ollie, for all your work and your team's work. Um, a little bit later, on the 6th of May 2010, the general election delivered the hung parliament and the coalition government came to power and social exclusion as an idea was dead. The following year, MEME and Revolving Doors uh, launched a joint document called Turning the Tide. And this set out our case for change and a vision for the future. And what we said was that we wanted to see in every local authority area, people experiencing multiple needs are supported by effective coordinated services and empowered to tackle their problems. For a little while, it seemed that we were getting some traction. Oh, hang on, this isn't working yet. There we are, I've got to catch up with this, look. There we are, there's the crash. There we are, Tim, there we are. we're there. Um, it seemed for a while that we were able to link it with the, the government's social justice narrative, but unfortunately the people in charge of that were really caught up with a very radical reform of the benefit system, uh, inventing and then delivering universal credit. So at this point, the National Lottery began exploring uh, a programme of multiple needs. And it was clear that this was going to be the opportunity to take all the learning from before and try and create a platform to move things forward. Now, working with the National Lottery at this time was brilliant. Um, and I really want to play, pay tribute to, uh, to the team at the time, and particularly Ngozi Lynn Cole and Roger Winhall, who were leading the work at the time. They and the rest of the National Lottery team really took the time to listen and to learn from all the different stakeholders and to make sure that we took all that knowledge and understanding from the previous two decades and build it into the program. So when it launched, it ticked a lot of our, the boxes on our wish list. We had 112 million pounds. We had a decent allocation uh, of money. We had a decent time frame, eight years. And the normal at that point was three years for pilots. And we'd had enough of pilots for three years, to be honest. Uh, we had uh, a decent allocation for evaluation. There we are. Uh, and we had an insistence that this is about cross sector partnerships, working not just one service, but working with all the stakeholders in a local area. It had an uh, expectation from the beginning that people with lived experience would be involved in designing the services uh, and involved in the system change. It had a focus on system change and learning and it had a support package to local areas. It was really clear that the, the care and the co-production that went into designing the program has really, really paid off. And I want to thank the, the National Lottery for that work. So here we are, the, 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 the program has launched, the areas are getting going and the slides will uh, move forward. But what was happening at that time? When we look around, we the, the storm, the hurricane of the financial crisis had really morphed into the prolonged downpour of austerity. And across the country, we were seeing really serious cuts to budgets to local authorities. We were seeing services closing, benefits frozen, entitlements reduced, and thresholds increased. By the time we got to 2013-14, this was already having a very visible impact on the levels of rough sleeping across the country. The sight of people in doorways in our towns and countries was becoming a common phenomenon again. And politicians were distracted. Cameron won the majority in 2015, but he had promised a Brexit referendum. 
And this dominated the next four years. And then COVID arrived. Against this hugely difficult background, I think what the Fulfilling Lives program has achieved is really remarkable. And I often wonder what happens if we had launched it against a fairer wind. But looking back from this vantage point, I think we can see some really significant milestones that have taught us things that we'll take forward on the next stage of the journey. And I want to pick out four in particular. I think the first one I want to talk about is co-production. The program has demonstrated that when we put co-production at the heart of service design and system change, it can be transformational, not just for the services and the people using them, but for the people involved as well. We've heard so many stories where the opportunity to be involved has been the critical early step in people's recovery journey. And I want to pay tribute to the many people who have shared their stories and the wisdom of their experience during this programme. For many, and we've heard a couple today already, telling the story is an act of real courage. And it, uh, we've seen the power appear in the story. Now, some people have gone on to lead what I think has been a great leap forward in expectations. People like Darren, who's here today, uh, and uh, all of you who have made the Fulfilling Lives programme something to be really proud of. I've got no doubt that co-production is a critical ingredient in the recipe for change that we need to see. The next point I want to sort of pick out is intersectionality. Now, this concept recognises that people's identities and sense of self are woven together from the full experience of their background. And for us, it helps to understand that the challenges that people face can be compounded by discrimination, abuse or violence that they've experienced because of the race, their gender, their disability, sexuality, or their migration story. Experiences such as racism or the stigma that comes with domestic abuse can act as barriers to services. And we've learned that we have to acknowledge these and recognize them in the design of the systems and services we're building. One of the Fulfilling Lives Partnerships, Opportunity Nottingham, worked with an organization called AWAS to publish a report called A Voice for All. This raised really important questions about how we define multiple disadvantage and who we exclude if we focus on the four aspects of the definition that underpins the Fulfilling Lives program. I think it's really important that we think about uh, the challenges that this report sets out. The lesson for us is that unless the people, people's real lives and experiences are at the forefront of our, our efforts to improve services and change systems, we will fail to see the whole picture. The next piece of learning I think is around system change. The Fulfilling Lives programme recognised from the start that just putting new services into the system wasn't going to work. And the insistence on partnership working from the start, involving the local authority and all the full range of partners came from this insight. And we all know the challenges about public services working in silos, commissioning for individual outcomes, and making it very difficult to create the holistic packages of support that people need. And at this point, I want to acknowledge the work of Julian Corner, Alice Evans, and the rest of the team at Lankelly Chase, who have made such a significant contribution to the thinking around systems change, but also funded the Hard Edges report, uh, which helped think, uh, uh, helped prove the evidence base for the work we're doing. So we're now testing new tools and looking to engage stakeholders in a different way. And we're all being asked to be systems leaders. Now, I don't want to say too much more about this because I know Rachel is going to be talking about what we've learned uh, in a second. So I'll leave it to her. Um, and the final thing I think that we've learned uh, and we've got to take forward is about trauma. We've learned from listening more carefully to people who are courageously seeking to make sense of the world in which their very foundations of psychological safety have been blown away. And we're also learning from a growing global literature about this, the work of Gabor Mate and Bessel van der Kolk and others, the ACES research in America. When we put all this together, I think we're experiencing a real revolution in our understanding of what it means to be human. This is a paradigm shift, I think, in how we understand how the human brain and the human body behave when we face toxic stress. And we're also learning how we as a society protect or reject people 
who have had these experiences. And we're learning about the service models that can make the difference and the kind of leaders that we need to run these organizations. As an aside, over the past eight years, we've seen how fulfilling lives has influenced across organizations. And I was delighted to see this week that SHP, who led on the Islington and Camden area, have just appointed a multiple disadvantaged development manager, Hi Shamara, if you're here, uh, to keep the agenda alive across their services. Alongside this, we've seen other important developments such as Housing First, which originated in the US, but draws on many of the insight that led to the link worker and navigator models. So here we are, we look towards the end of our journey. And from the beginning, I think uh, we all realized that the eight years was gonna pass quickly. And we were starting to think about the legacy right from the beginning. Now, fortunately in 2015, we ended up with someone heading that program, the Fulfilling Lives program, that totally understood that that had to happen. And the brilliant Laura Furness, uh, who's here today, and uh, I'm mentioning her because she threatened to heckle me earlier, uh, was totally, totally focused on the legacy of the programme. Uh, she was instrumental in discussions with government departments and politicians to find a way of embedding all the work going forward. And I'm sure she can tell the story better than I can, but I remember her once telling me that there was a pivotal moment when a group of experts by experience came to a meeting in the cabinet office in discussions with civil servants. And it was their stories and their experience that made the penny drop for government. And what happened next was brilliant. In 2019, Treasury announced the spending, the Shared Outcomes Fund, and with Laura and Ollie and others pushing from the outside and some real champions on the inside, they managed to get an allocation of funding for multiple disadvantage. The National Lottery came in with match funding and changing futures was born. Now I know Kirby and maybe the minister will talk about that program later on, but for now, I just want to acknowledge the work of the team, Val and Shane and all the others uh, who are here today. It's really good to see you. Um, so there we are, uh, but we've got some challenges looking forward. And I want to just mention two of them. Um, now, when I go for a hike, uh, and from that point, when I look back, what I know is that the next bit is going to be the hardest because I've got a dodgy knee and actually climbing down is harder than going up. So it's still going to be hard and we've still got some difficult challenges to, to, uh, to look at. Um, the first is, I think, that we need to hone our political narrative and argument to win the long term support for what we're trying to do. Now, I've used a lot of jargon today, co-production, trauma informed services, intersectionality, system change. These are words and ideas that is useful for us to, to, to use together but they're not particularly helpful when we talk to the politicians and the public about what we want to achieve. So we have to find the language and the stories to get our message across, especially to those with the political power to make the difference. We need narratives that resonate across political parties and ideologies. And I think we've come a long way. The see the whole picture work is brilliant. Let's build on that and let's take what we've learned to a wider circle of people. We have a brilliant story to tell, so let's tell it. And so at this point, I'd like to pay tribute to the evaluation team, CFE and University of Sheffield, to Rachel Morton, Beth Collinson, and all of her team. When, uh, when, it gets, when, when we think about going forward, we've got to decide what we want at the end of the, uh, the Changing Futures programme. So what are we looking for? Are we looking for an extension of the programme into more areas? Are we looking for a comprehensive strategy for the multiple disadvantage? So let's think about what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to win that argument. And the second challenge and the last point I want to make is about how we think about young people. The Westminster Changing Futures programme includes a new team targeting young people. And what they've been finding is that the definition of multiple disadvantage that we use doesn't work so well for this group. They're finding people who clearly have faced real trauma and disadvantage in their lives who have seven or eight aces behind them, but they don't tick the boxes for the fulfilling lives definition or the, the change in futures definition. They're not yet in that pattern that we see in later in life. Now, this is the opportunity to intervene in those young people's lives and make sure that we divert them off that track that we can know they can be on. I think we need to pay particular attention to make sure we don't leave a gap between the supporting families agenda 
and the Change in Futures agenda. Let's make sure we really focus and learn how to work with these young people so they don't end up caught in the problems that we're so familiar with. If we're going to stop the intergenerational transmission of trauma, we need to find ways to identify and engage and support those young people. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. Uh, that's my story, I guess. Others will have a different way of seeing it, but I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. Thanks to everybody that's been involved. It's been a brilliant program. Thank you to Miranda and the team for setting up the conference today. And finally, thank you to all of you for everything you've done over the last eight years. Uh, I started at the beginning saying that we can do things, difficult things when we do things together. And we've come a long way, but the journey isn't over. So let's keep going together. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realise there was a mic here. I was trying to get a mic. Thank you so much, Dominic. Um, we have some time for questions. Are there any, any questions in the audience or any questions online, Chris? Yes, there yes, are. Yes, yes, we've got one from online. So, so how engaged do you think that decision makers, such as politicians, are in multiple disadvantage? Hello. That one's working. Hi. How engaged? Um, I don't think that there's many uh, politicians really who understand this agenda properly yet. Um, we've occasionally seen over the last few years, we've seen a handful that have really grasped it and have led on it. Um, but that's, I think that's why I said we've got that challenge because, you know, we, we all know how important this is and what a difference it makes. Um, but I don't think yet we've taken that message well enough out there into the country and into the politicians. So I think that's in a way that's our responsibility now. Uh, if they're not engaged, that's down to us. You know, we've got to do something about that. Um, we've got the material, we've got the evidence, we've got the stories, we've got the economic data, we've got the outcome, we've got everything we need now to make that argument. And we've got, you know, we've got a government department that's brought into this as well. Um, so I think we're, we're in a really good position, uh, but we're going to have to keep fighting for it because it's very easy for this stuff to get lost. You know, there's a, a change in a slight change in policy um, and, and this stuff can very easily fall off the agenda. So uh, let's let's all get really stuck into that. Uh, how many people are here today? I don't know, 100 or so. You know, let's all contact our MPs and talk to them. Let's let's really take this stuff forward. And I think, you know, we're going to have to support. Uh, the changing uh, futures team uh, and we're going to need to argue from the outside and the inside to, to get this secured and, and moving forward. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Any more online, Chris? Yes, yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you were engaging stakeholders and, and, and moving forwards. You know, how exactly is this being done? Uh, so uh, I think there's lots of different ways. Um, I mean, first of all, there's all the material that's come from the, uh, the Fulfilling Lives program is online and people can use that. There's so much brilliant stuff there. Um, and the see the full picture uh, work is great. I hope that will continue. Um, we've got to keep investing in, in getting the message right. Uh, but the Changing Futures program, lots of you I know are involved in that as well. So this is the government program we'll be hearing more about. Um, there's some fantastic things happening with that program and it's the, the great thing i'm involved with the westminster um uh, changing futures program and what we're seeing there is stakeholders uh from uh and strategic leaders from all the different parts of the system coming together in a way that i've really not seen before even under fulfilling lives it was sometimes difficult to get some of these people around the table um so you know we've got meetings where we've got directors of public health we've got people from the nhs from the ccg uh, from all the different parts of, of local government uh, coming together with the voluntary sector um, and we're seeing we are seeing some really genuine uh, discussions about what can happen how we can change the system so i'm i think we, we we've got a real potential there i'm really conscious this stuff takes time and we haven't got a lot of time in this program so we've got to we've got to find a way of buying some more space and time and making sure 
uh, that we can do that work. And we've also got to find ways of hardwiring it in to our local authorities. So it's, you know, local authorities should be doing this, even if there isn't a, a central government backed program. I mean, it helps that there is, but you know, that's that's where we've got to get to um, is, is that local authorities are doing this because they understand that it's it's something that they need to do. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, and yeah, very struck by the power again of relationships, the power of, of peer support um, that you spoke about. And so can we have another round of applause for Dominic B? Thank you. Uh, so time to welcome our next keynote speaker. Um, by the way, Dominic will be here all day. If you didn't uh, get to ask a question or you felt a bit shy, I'm sure that he will welcome conversations in between talks and, and in break times. Um, so do grab him uh, if you have something that you'd like to discuss. Um, so yeah, our next keynote speaker is Rachel Morton. Rachel is a social researcher and project manager with many years experience in the public and voluntary sectors. Uh, she joined CFE Research in 2012 and has been involved with the National Evaluation for, fulfilling, for the Fulfilling Lives programme since the very start and more recently is taking a leading role in the changing futures that Dominic was just speaking about um, in the programme evaluation. Rachel is going to share some of the key learning from the evaluation and in particular how the programme has worked towards creating systems change. Uh, so a round of applause, please, for Rachel. Thanks, Millie, and good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to see so many of you here today. Hello to everyone who's joining us online as well. That's a sort of a, a new step forward for us in sort of this hybrid uh, way of working. Really exciting um, to have so many people be able to join us from, from different places. Um, and great to see so many familiar faces back from the days of the Fulfilling Lives programme of the last eight years. Um, but also really great to welcome um, some sort of newer colleagues from the Changing Futures programme as well. Um, it was back in 2013 when CFE first got involved uh, in the changing in, in the Pavilion Lives program. Um, because actually, although it was an eight year program starting in 2014, the National Lottery Community Fund brought us on board uh, as evaluators before the 12 areas had even been decided or announced. So we've been doing this for nine years now. Um, and back at the start of that, we'd never taken on anything with that kind of length of evaluation. It was huge and, and daunting and complex. And back then, I couldn't quite imagine what it might be like to be here now eight nine years later so it, it does feel sort of slightly surreal to be here it's sort of as we approach the finishing line um as Melissa said i'm going to talk a little bit about um what we learned from the program where do i point this there we are um in terms of systems change so the aim of fulfilling lives very brief recap was support people facing multiple disadvantage to access more joined up and person-centered services, particularly targeting those who were uh, had the most uh, complex and entrenched needs and who weren't already getting the support that they needed. Um, as well as changing the lives of individuals, it was about changing that wider system too. That was always a really important part of it. Um, and alongside that, involving people with lived experience, involving people who were getting support from the program throughout that process. And throughout our evaluation, um, the national evaluation team and all the local evaluators um, have amassed a, a wealth of evidence of learning and insight on a range of topics. And that includes showing the benefit and the impact that the programme's made to individuals. Um, but as the programme draws to a close, one of our final pieces of work has been drawing together the learning and what we found in terms of the, the systems change side of things. So we've uh, spoken to staff from all the uh, fulfilling lives uh, areas. Uh, we've uh, held workshops with them. We've had uh, interviews with stakeholders from a range of sectors. So that includes police, public health, housing, homelessness, substance misuse services and the voluntary sector. Um, the National Expert Citizens Group, NECG, who are now here today, uh, have also been great in that they've gone out and gathered reflections from across their networks of people who've been supported by the programme, people with lived experience, to get their views on how they perceive changes to have uh, um, happened over the last eight years. 
Um, and we've also looked back on the wealth of reports that we've amassed over the eight years. So this isn't something we've just come to at the end. We've been gathering the evidence um, as things have progressed. Um, and the quotes in the presentation here today uh, are, are largely from those wider stakeholders rather than staff on the programme. So we're still analysing the data, we're still working through working up that final report, it will be published in the next couple of months. But today I just want to highlight a few key themes, some of the uh, emerging findings that are coming out so far and we thought were worth uh, celebrating here today. Um, first of all, why, why systems change? Why is this so important when it comes to multiple disadvantage? So. I think I don't probably need to make much of a case to the audience here today for the need to do something different when it comes to multiple disadvantage. Um, if you're here today, I'm guessing that's because you recognise that actually not having effective support uh, for people facing multiple disadvantage results in a tragic waste of human life and potential. Since the start of the programme, at least 200 people on the programme have died that we know about. The average age for those who died was just 44 for men, and 40 for women, the youngest was just 21. We've seen that waste of potential, and, and that's just the, the most extreme form of that waste of potential. We've seen that in the data that we've collected. Many of you here today will have seen it in real life and know that this isn't just statistics, these are people. Dominic mentioned the See the Full Picture website, the Multiple Disadvantage Day website. The slides here, um, uh, um, from that site and that uh, website really nicely gathers together a number of uh, human stories of people so the stories behind those statistics um, I urge you to sort of take a look at that if you're not familiar with it already um, and again as Dominic said this isn't about just putting in some new services or tweaking some of the services that exist it's um, about changing the system so those facing multiple disadvantage and those who work closely with them know that often people will face a complicated system to navigate one that's too often siloed impersonal bureaucratic um, and creates unnecessary demand for crisis and emergency services so one of our reports um, and there's a selection of them on the table at the back of the room that you can pick up one of our reports focused on uh, this the, the challenges just to the mental health system and getting support through that and as part of that we looked at case studies to map out a typical journey, if you like, through the mental health system. Um, and the slide here just shows that journey map. Now, the idea is that you're not going to be able to read all that on, on the screen, but the idea is that it just illustrates some of the complexities and the number of barriers. So everything in sort of purple there is, is a barrier that we know that people face. And that was just an example of some of them. Um, so those barriers, they're not just about individual service shortcomings. It's about how services relate to each other, the staff, the contracts, the commissioning, the culture, the whole system. So there's that need to focus not just what's on wrong or not on what's wrong with the individual, but what's wrong with the system. And system change should be disruptive, um, but equally disruption can also create opportunities for change. And I think one of the biggest disruptions we've seen in recent years is obviously the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the associated lockdown and social distancing measures. Um, this undoubtedly created lots of challenges for Fibling Lines partnerships, but it also created opportunities too. So we put together a, a report pulling together some of the learning and experiences of that time. So did our colleagues at Cordis Bright looking at the Making Every Adult Matter areas uh, and the uh, NECG also put together a great report on the same subject. And they all find very similar things, which was that um, there was, in, in some cases, a change in perception of what was uh, the major risk, COVID. And so services in many cases became uh, more responsive, uh, cutting of red tape and bureaucracy, uh, people getting assessments much more quickly. And obviously the, the fantastic work of everyone in, in actually accommodating large numbers of rough sleepers. Um, lots of people clearly struggled with COVID uh, pandemic and with lockdown, um, but we also had stories of greater engagement. Um, and the phrase there, uh, the myth of non-engagement, is one that I've taken from the excellent NECG report, as I just think it sums it up so nicely, that actually if you offer systems where um, that are compassionate, that give people choice and control, um, then people will engage. But all of that creates requires systems change. So what has changed when it comes to fulfilling lives areas? I think interestingly, perhaps one of the more difficult things to change with systems is, is culture. But actually, this is one of the things that um, more people mentioned that, than anything else, I think, uh, looking at the interviews and the data that we've collected. Um, so I think there is evidence that in those areas where it's been working, fulfilling lives has contributed to shifts in attitudes and understanding when it comes to multiple disadvantage. 
So staff and stakeholders spoke about seeing shifts in perspectives, uh, changes in the conversations that were happening in local areas and with services, a move away from more medicalized models or a focus on perceived uh, individual shortcomings and a move uh, towards greater recognition of the role of adverse childhood experiences um, and of trauma. Uh, stakeholders spoke about more understanding, less judgment, a move away from blame and hopefully re reduced stigma as a result. Um, related to that, interviewees and people we spoke to talked about a greater openness amongst colleagues and services to, to just do things differently, a recognition that actually what is required here is that whole systems approach. Um, I think we can probably make the case that the issue, uh, as Dominic highlighted, is, is more visible, particularly in fulfilling lives areas than it was. Um, it was a voluntary sector-led initiative, um, but now we've started to gather examples of statutory services in areas beginning to take on board learning and get involved. Um, in several fulfilling lives areas, multiple disadvantage or effective models of support, such as housing first, are being included in local strategies and plans. Um, and things like that are being explicitly mentioned in service specifications. But as we've already recognised, importantly, we now have a central government funded uh, programme that's specifically looking at this issue in changing futures. And the fact that we have uh, ministerial interest and the Minister for Equalities, Local Government, Faith and Communities attending later today, I think that's just an indicator of how that multiple disadvantage is now getting some political attention that, that it needs. Um, keep focus of CIFA. Fulfilling Lives has been um, developing and embedding co-production in the system. And again, I think we've got evidence of, of a shift uh, in areas in that regard. So stakeholders seen the benefits and the impact of involving people with lived experience. Um, they've heard directly people from lived experience. They've seen how powerful that can be and how that can motivate staff and the need for change. Um, stakeholders and people with lived experience alike have uh, reported to us a growing interest in co-production uh, evidenced by requests for people with lived experience to get involved uh, and a shift away from more mere consultation to more co-production. There's still a long way to go. There's still things to be done. There's still a need to tackle some power imbalances um, and to make sure that um, uh, it, it, co-production is the norm and is really embedded across the piece rather than just in pockets. But I think um, you know there's, there's some real, real strides made. And also we've heard, heard about more opportunities for people with lived experience to get involved in the workforce, particularly through peer support programmes. Um, I think one of the things that Fulfilling Lives has done that we've seen is creating structures um, uh, to enable greater collaboration and coordination across teams and sectors and agencies. So that includes things like information sharing systems, service navigation teams, trauma-informed networks, multi-agency groups that exist to uh, coordinate care and support packages, informal networks of practitioners, action groups to look at blockages when it comes to systems. Um, many of these structures, or some of these structures, certainly looks at to continue beyond the, the programme, some being built into commission services. Um, we've heard um, about the importance of trauma and psychologically informed ways of working. This is something that Fulfilling Lives areas have really championed. Um, and again, our evidence suggests that these approaches are now gaining traction, being more recognised in local areas. Um, several stakeholders talking about embedding them in, in, in business as usual or, or being writing them into service delivery specifications. And frontline staff are really critical to all of this work. Um, the job of supporting people affected by multiple disadvantage is, can be difficult, can lead to vicarious trauma and burnout for staff. So it's important, again, and I think this, this is something that was highlighted to us, that the programme has helped to emphasise the importance of support and the need to invest in staff well-being such as um, clinical supervision reflective practice and other support um, and I think one of the legacies of the program is the staff that have been involved that have been um, working on so the partnerships or involved in workforce development programs um, they're a real legacy uh, so as they move on to new roles in different sectors they take hopefully their um, their knowledge their learning their outlook with them and so we can spread the learning that way and I think reflecting personally on my own experiences of working on the Changing Futures programme, which includes some areas that um, were fulfilling lives areas and some areas that weren't, I think you can see a difference when we meet with staff and stakeholders from those areas. Um, I don't want to take anything away from the, the skills and the expertise and the enthusiasm of Changing Futures areas that didn't get fulfilling lives funding, but I think there's a, a, a subtle but a noticeable difference between the areas that we can pick up on that we had fulfilling lives funding. There's sort of something around a maturity of relationships and depth of thought and conversations that we see in those areas um, that I think is sort of testament to the benefits of having this um, funding and this sort of 
extended period of learning to develop those relationships. Um, I want to go on to talk a little bit about the sort of mechanisms for change, the sort of things that partnerships actually did that we seem to have been um, associated with, with having some impact. Um, again, just a few other sort of highlights and some common approaches that we've picked up so far. Learning programmes. Um, partnerships have created opportunities to upskill the workforce. So traditional training courses and communities of practice as well. Um, and these seem to have found a ready audience from sectors who are hungry to understand more about trauma-informed ways of working um, and about adopting a systems thinking approach where that often isn't available in their organisations. Um, and involving people with lived experience in the design and delivery of, uh, of those training courses, I think, has been really impactful. Um, so it creates a level of authenticity and, and impact um, that training courses without that involvement don't have. Um, I mentioned the range of structures um, that have been uh, set up uh, by Fulfilling Lives areas. Um, I think so much of what has uh, been beneficial about the programme comes down to relationships, whether that's building trusting relationships between support workers and the people they support, but also between staff, different organisations, different sectors, between commissioners and commissioned services. Um, and so in the course of our evaluation, we've often found that those structures, those multi-agency groups have um, had benefits beyond their initial purpose because they've provided a, for a forum, whether it's informal or formal, for people to come together, to talk to each other, to get to know each other, to build those relationships, to understand what each other's services do, um, what your priorities are, what your particular um, pressure points are as well. And that's all helped to develop that understanding and a collaborative approach. And sometimes those groups coming together for one thing can be a springboard for people going on to do something else. Um, pilot and demonstration projects. So much of what Fulfilling Lives did was about demonstrating we can do things differently. Um, and so that could be things like having first pilots in a number of areas, um, demonstrating accessible um, psychological and mental health support is possible for this group, um, specialist support for women, personalised budgets, peer mentoring programmes and so forth. And so by gathering the evidence and the learning from those um, and getting the word out in local areas, that's generated sort of interest from, from other partners who've seen what's been achieved and, and, are, and are interested in finding out more. So related to that is there's just been a huge wealth of learning and evidence. So the stuff that we've done nationally, but also each local area has often commissioned their own external evaluation, but that's all been, so been supplemented by uh, teams of really talented and passionate in-house learning evaluation and um, staff who have provided data analysis, case studies, toolkits, briefings, blogs, short films, you name it. And much of that is collected on the evaluation website. It's a real resource. Um, and I think, again, that's sort of, building up an evidence base that's hard to ignore. And, and finally, I just wanted to sort of reflect on a few points that have come up from our, um, our interviews that we've been carrying out over recent months around what it has been about the Filling Lives programme and the way that's been set up um, that's really contributed to change. And I think Dominic's already alluded to some of these points here. Um, although let me pause at this point to say, yeah, this is today is very much about celebrating the achievements of the programme. Um, and Everything I've highlighted so far has been very positive, um, but let, let's be clear, the system isn't fixed. It's not all sorted. Um, people who spoke to often talked in terms of things like laying the foundations, building blocks, planting the seeds of change, getting the ball rolling, rather than getting to a, you know, a, a final destination. Maybe there is no final destination when it comes to systems change. It's an ongoing journey. Um, and the sustainability of some of these changes is still yet to be tested, really. Um, people already are talking about, oh, is the, is the learning going to be lost? Um, and a concern that still too often change is down to a few people who really get it and are passionate in driving things forward um, and keeping things going. And again, as we've as we already heard, there's still big challenges, um, as highlighted in some of our thematic reports that are still to be, to, to, to be really um, tackled and, um, and solved. So, People still being released from prison to no fixed abode, lack of appropriate and affordable accommodation, and the catch-22 situation of people with co-occurring mental ill health and substance misuse problems when it comes to getting support. So all of that is just to emphasise how really hard systems change is. Um, and at the start of the programme, we interviewed a few senior people from across uh, each of the partnerships, and they set out what their ambitions were for the programme, what they thought they'd achieve in years one, three, five, and so on. And looking back at it now, I think a lot of it is, with hindsight, extremely optimistic, thinking about the actual pace of change. Um, 
So one of the important factors, I suppose, of fulfilling lives is that there was that longer term investment over eight years, acknowledging that this stuff takes time, um, particularly building relationships, um, getting to know the challenges um, and, and starting to sort of move things forward. Um, let's not underestimate the impact of a substantial amount of investment. As we've heard, it was often in the context of austerity policies. Um, it's important that the funding wasn't a replacement for statutory funding, but some of the models of support that uh, Forbidden Lives have, have demonstrated, so that long-term, open-ended support provided by a staff team with small caseloads who get the support themselves through things like reflective practice, proper co-production with proper support for people who lived experience to make a contribution, all of that requires proper resourcing. But obviously Fulfilling Arts has been about so much more than just that money. Um, and a number of people we spoke to, staff and stakeholders, highlighted something about that test and learn approach that the National Lottery Community Fund had taken, um, providing support and challenge, allowing areas to sort of get on and work out what the issues were there in their local area um, and, and try things out and determine locally what felt to be needed. So something that was enabling rather than prescriptive um, with no hard targets to meet. So something again where that gave them the freedom to try things, take a risk. If it doesn't work, we've learned something. Um, so that's sort of just sort of highlights, I think, that we've got so far. Um, as I say, we're working on that final report on systems change, which we published in the next few months. We're also pulling together a final report that will summarise a lot of the key learning from across the programme and act as a bit of a navigation guide, so you can find your way through all those resources that we've talked about and hopefully find things that are useful to you. Um, we've also been working with the Journal of Housing, Care and Support on putting together a special edition, which we published in September, and that includes articles from across the partnerships on, on various aspects of multiple disadvantage. So again, another legacy of, of, of evidence. Um, and all of that information can be found on the evaluation website. Uh, and we've got some hard copies of some of our reports at the back of the room too. Um, just a final thought I want to leave you with. Um, so this is the words of a partnership staff member who, who we spoke to. Um, and we asked them to reflect on whether they do you know, things differently. Um, and of course, there are always things that you might do differently with hindsight, but then perhaps there would be less learning. Um, so this person said, it's the journey. I think journey is going to be a big metaphor for today. They said, quote, it's the journey. It's not just where we got to. I think we had to go on that journey to develop the values and develop the ethos, end quote. The journey of fulfilling lives is coming to an end. Another one is just beginning. What a ride it's been. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Rachel. And it's good to hear kind of a bit of a breakdown of what system change really mean and what that kind of entails and actually the complexity of that as well. Um, we've got a bit of time for questions. Uh, are there any questions in the room, first of all? Yes, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Um, what has been your highlight of working on the national evaluation? Hello. Hi. Um, I think one of the key things that's come out from across um, the, the, the evaluation in particular is importance of relationships. Um, and so I think I think my highlight for me is actually the people that we work with on the journey. So I have, didn't include it in my presentation, but it's a really good opportunity because I want to pay tribute to um, the partnership leads, the evaluation and learning leads, all the staff at the, at the Fulfilling Arms Partnerships, um, the experts, the National Expert Citizens Group. It's been absolutely amazing working with you all. We've asked a lot of you. So we've asked you to sort of set up interviews for us, introduce us to stakeholders, introduce us to beneficiaries, host workshops and focus groups, collect huge amounts of data, process it and send it to us. And you've done it all. And we wouldn't be able to do it without that contribution from the partnership. So yeah, thank you all to that. And thank you for the question. Um, I think that's probably been my highlight. We've met some and worked with some amazing people. Um, from an evaluation perspective, Rachel, um, you know, did you use any methods that you hadn't before? Oh, blimey. Um, yes, I mean, this has been a huge learning journey as well for us as, as evaluators. Um, I think just 
dealing with such a big program, a long-term program, we've had to be flexible. Things have changed. The program's developed. The context has been con you know, consistently changing. We couldn't imagine when we started out back in 2013. Um, I mean, we talked about what things might occur and we thought, well, there's going to be at least one general election, but you know, I don't think we ever saw quite exactly what the, the future in, entailed. So we didn't, you know, no one foresaw a global pandemic. So that's forced us to use, make greater use of online um, and, and um, virtual methods. Um, we've had to be very flexible. We've tried things and not everything has worked. Um, so we worked to um, gather information um, from a group of people that is quite difficult to gather information from about their experiences. We have to be very careful about that. I think we've learned a lot about doing that. Um, we tried to gather information from a comparison group and we did get some useful data on that. It didn't work out as quite as we planned, but again, I think we've learned a lot from doing that. Um, we are putting together, actually, I should have mentioned a report on our learning um, of the evaluation, local evaluations methods, mm -hmm. things we've learned, the things we want to pass on. And again, that will be something that we'll be uh, publishing in the next coming couple of months between now and September. Hello. Hi there. Is it on? Okay. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm from Canada. And um, uh, I'm here because of some of the fantastic things that I've seen relative to the narratives around changing futures, etc. We in my country we've had tremendous trouble uh, tremendous trouble integrating programs, creating, you know, wraparound supports for individuals, et cetera, in part because of, you know, selling the concept and the notion to decision makers. And I think to sell it, uh, we're going to have to talk about the opportunity to, for example, generate downstream savings. It's very instrumental and very, you know, it's not a great way of explaining it. But nonetheless, are there any stories that, that I can take back with respect to helping people, getting at root causes, and actually demonstrably saving the ecosystem, which is one of the decision factors that any just, you know that a politician will will drive towards? Yeah, so we did um, collect information on use of public services. Um, and again, there's some copies of the report we published um, at the back of the room on this about why we need to invest in multiple needs. And that was our attempt to look at uh, that um, and that evidence that, um, and we've got sort of qualitative research as well to back this up as well as, as the numbers that um, people were, were being resorting to using, um, you know, inappropriate crisis and emergency services because they weren't like say getting that upstream support that they needed. And there's a cost implication to that. And so we've shown the high levels of use of things like accident and emergency, um, number of arrests, um, um, uh, evictions uh, for, from social housing and so forth, and the cost of that. Um, and we've also shown um, significant, statistically significant improvements in the uh, reduce, reducing the use of some of those, those crisis and emergency services. Now, it's not as simple as saying, well, that saves you money. It, it, it creates an opportunity to use that resource differently, I suppose, is, is the way we've, we've perhaps thought about that. Um, but I think it's also fair to say that some of the interventions that you need um, could potentially, you know, if, if someone's not getting any support at all and then come on board, there's always been that acknowledgement on this programme that there's that potential that actually some of this stuff is, is, is going to require additional funding but it's about how you're using that funding in a most constructive way um, i'm sure some of the partnerships here today and maybe in some of the workshops will be able to talk again about how they've managed to um, get strategic decision makers on board and, and make the case to them um, that's an important strand of it but i think it's sometimes it's the human stories as well um, and some of the sort of films and the sort of things we've seen today that can also cut through and, and make people want to act as, as much as, as the numbers thanks okay. Um, yeah. Hi, um, I know one of the challenges that um, I know changing features areas, but I imagine this occurred in fulfilling lives areas as well, um, that they face is um, figuring out how to sustain the change that they've created. And um, I was just wondering to what extent within your evaluation you were able to unpick what systems, new system structures have been put in place um, to sustain those changes, but also um, what are your reflections on being able to measure and track that change to be able to ensure that the you know people and the systems constantly work and figure out and improve how to um, sustain those changes going forward? 
I think to a certain extent, we're never really going to know in, in, in the extent to which the change that has happened and we've observed in the filling lives areas sustained, sustained until, you know, um, a few years hence, I guess. Um, I think changing futures provides an opportunity to, to, to continue that change in some areas. Um, I think there are positive indications that we found, like say where things have been picked up by other services, stuff by statutory services and have built uh, ways of working into or priorities into their strategic plans. So it's a formal part of that. Um, and some of the changing futures areas finished a few years before most of the areas that are sort of coming to, to a conclusion now. So we did manage to catch up with a few uh, stakeholders from those areas where the programme had come to end. And again, there was it was a mixed bag. There were some positive stories there, things that are continuing, where there had been that sort of change that seemed to be sustainable, where it was more of a, a cultural shift rather than a um, you know, something that, that was short term. But I think it, it, it's fair to say it's definitely a risk and it's not clear that, yes, this is it. This is embedded now. We can take the foot off the gas and it'll all be, be fine. Because I think, as I say, one of the things that a lot of people suggested was we're still worried about what if X person moves on or leaves because they really drive this. So it is about getting more people on board and, and getting more people to understand um, just that, that shift in ethos of way of working. Thank you very much, Ashley. That's all we've got time for. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, actually, while you were talking, I was thinking about ideas from different systems throughout my life. So, uh, and um, yeah, just the difference of uh, now in the early days, feeling you know, about the facts of my ways was the kind of best system where I sat. And they were put the bubble on, which, you know, be out. And in later years, as I said, I've changed enough to uh, encounter some really uh, forward thinking, trauma informed uh, systems and people, uh, and, and the difference that many of my birth was being they wanted me to win and they were helping me, they were meeting where I was. And, and, and the, the result, you know, the result was that I did a big range of services and, and make a long term recovery after those experiences. Um, and yeah, so very much, yeah, thinking a lot about my own experience uh, that I was to talk from there. And um, that's so if we have a round of applause, please, for Rachel. And uh, so, so far we've heard from the working in the field of the started. Uh, but now we have very excitingly, I'm very excited about this part of the, the program today. We have a performance, a spoken word performance from an incredible artist uh, called Selfie Sofa. So uh, he's a writer from London, uses his work to raise awareness around issues of uh, the issue of homelessness, uh, mental ill health, and challenge the stigma uh, that people who experience that affects. Uh, he's motivated by his passion to see better solutions uh, and problems with mental health. Um, and most of his work is inspired by his own experience and the experience of his friends uh, that he's met along the way. Um, uh, so he's going to perform a couple of songs from his, or sorry, a couple of stories from his own, from his latest collection. Um, can you please welcome so Sorry, please welcome so many places. For our start, has anybody ever seen me perform before? No? You're in for a surprise, because when I do, I always make a fool of myself, like the step over there. And don't worry about getting my name wrong. I get it wrong all the time. As you heard, my name is Nervous Sofas, and I'm a surfing wreck. I'm surfing sofas. I'm, I'm a nervous wreck. I, I don't know why it always goes down like this if you do one of these readings. But um, thank you guys for having me here today. I'm going to try and make this a little bit entertaining. I'll tell you what usually happens when I do one of these readings. Like, for me, it's like a gamble of how the audience is going to react either. They might cry, they might smile. Majority of the time they do laugh because I make up a fool of myself, not intentionally, it just always happens that way. But um. I want to share some poetry with you guys today. Once again, named Surfing Sofa. We've got the little man surfing on the sofa there. And um, 
most of my work is based around stuff like homelessness. And um, I think I want to start with a piece today called Invisible Broken Wings. And I think you guys will be able to get the gist of it. Also, I'm not a good speaker. I'm nothing like Rachel and Dom and Millie. I'm just, I come, I read, I go. So I should probably sharpen this, get on with it. All right. I've met angels who were sent from heaven with the best intentions. Their mission was to perform miracles, grow and sing. Some of them were led astray down miserable roads of sin. Now they sleep on the streets with invisible broken wings. Their hearts remain warm, even though they live in the cold. Now, some have given me food, some have given me clothes, some have given me tears, and some have given me jokes. And when I needed it most, some have given me hope. Angels with invisible broken wings who deserve to fly. But their feathers were plucked and they were left to hurt and cry. Their dreams were burnt alive, but like a phoenix, they will rise once their feathers grow back and then their dreams will be revived. Now, I've met angels who were sent from heaven with the best intentions. And although some were led astray down miserable roads of sin, they fulfill their mission to perform miracles, grow and sing. And I pray they can heal their invisible broken wings. Thank you. Should also mention I suffer with very bad social phobia. My doctor, she's like, I need to get it together. And she's right, but it's hard sometimes. And in a setting like this, I kind of wish the state would just open its mouth and swallow me and then you know, but you know, the show must go on. Um this next one. I kind of battle with the title of this one. I originally named it Drugs Give Hugs. But I feel like the title can be kind of triggering. So kind of renamed it to Drugs and Hugs and uh, kind of struggling to like pick an actual name for it. So with what I've told you, you could take it as whatever and you give it a name even and I'll just read it. All right. My tissues because I've got a bad habit of crying sometimes. <laughs> Okay, now, many people are quick to label addiction as a reason for homelessness, but are slow to label anything as a reason for addiction, except for what I see in my opinion to be reasons full of fiction. Now, some believe that addiction is a choice, and some believe that it's genetically deployed. Some believe it's a disorder of the primary brain, and some believe that it's a personality trait. But once you've really empathized and analyzed it, some have severe traumatic pain, which they have to fight with. Some attack it with rocks to crush it, and pacify it. Some attack it with syringes of stuff which can tranquilize it. Drugs are evil and some drugs are lethal. But it's easier to get love from drugs than it is to get love from people. I mean, maybe the world some feel are so unreal that when no one will hug us, those drugs will. I mean, it might be hard for me to get a hug from you but it's easy to get drugs and drugs can do what a hug can do. Like studies prove that hugs can boost dopamine, serotonin, endorphins and oxytocin, those happy hormones that drugs can boost. Also, whenever we experience physical pain, 
pain regulating opioids are formed in our brains. And when we experience emotional pain, those same pain opioids are formed in our brains, which means our brains respond to emotional pain and physical pain in very similar ways. Now, maybe these substance, substances people are known to abuse are the bandages which ease their emotional wounds. Did you know rejection causes the brain to produce the amount of pain regulating opioids that it would if a knife cut you? That's what rejection does. The brain responds to rejection as if it was a knife wound. So how many times have rejections in life cut you? Imagine growing up neglected with childhood traumas, then trying drugs for the first time in your life. That feeling of receiving the hugs you never had and knowing these could be obtained at any time for a price. There's people who risk overdosing for hugs that come from drugs. What these people could do with is some compassion and love and people that they can trust so that they can open up. They need compassionate ears, a helping hand or a hug. But if you're scared to touch them, it's fine, the drugs will hug them. And if you choose to hate them, it's fine, the drugs will love them. You know, if you're scared to touch me, it's fine. The drugs will hug me. And if you choose to hate me, it's fine. The drugs will love me. And if you choose to hurt me, it's fine. The drugs will heal me. But because of your rejections, the drugs will, will probably kill me. Thank you. You know, whenever I do these readings and performances, I kind of normally leave like a like a low kind of mood in the room. And I've just like spotted a, a poem called Hope, which kind of ties into what I made in the video in the movie at the beginning, said at the end of this video. But I don't think I'm gonna go into that yet. I've got two more I wanna quickly try to get out and then we'll see if we've got enough time to go into Hope. All right, this next one's called Questioning Stars. And it was about, uh, I don't want to give you that too much details, but it's about a couple of people I know and I kind of merged them into one. All right, a victim of violence. This violence left scars on her thighs, on her arms, on her mind, on her heart. She stopped looking for the light at the dark end of the tunnel which felt like it's a farce. See, cause she didn't find one sight of a spark. No, she sleeps in a tent at night in a park. She even offered them to donate it to charity. Sometimes she would glance at the sky and then ask the stars if they knew why her life was so hard. Now, her fingers are numb from fighting the elements She's held on to hope for so long that her palms, her blisters, icicles would do anything they can to be decorations dangling from her broken heart. Her soul is exhausted and her feet are sore from the long walk on life's rocky road. To prevent winter's icy breath touching her skin, she cocoons herself in a sleeping bag chrysalis now it's late and it's cold, silent and dark. She sleeps in a tent at night in a park. Sometimes she would glance at the sky and then ask the stars if they knew why her life was so hard. Thank you.
Um, you guys want to hear one of my favorites? Yeah. <laughs> All right. This one's called Where the Heart Is. And I like it. I like poetry because it can challenge old ways of thinking. It could inspire new ways of thinking. And sometimes it could just be nothing, just be words. But this one, I wanted to ch challenge the old idiom, idiom, how do you pronounce it? Where the heart is. All right, let's go. They say home is where the heart is, correct? Well, let's take that out of context. If I'm heartless, am I homeless? If I'm homeless, am I heartless? They say home is where the heart is. Yeah, I'm homeless, but not heartless. So what am I meant to think when they say home is where the heart is? See, they say home is where the heart is. Yeah, I struggle to accept this because I do not have a home, but I know just where my heart is. And I know I have a heart which I used to care for others who are sleeping on the streets through all the coldness and the hardships. They say home is where the heart is, but I do not have a home. I sleep on sofas and on carpets, feeling hopeless, trapped in darkness. When I'm homeless and my heart sinks, when winter begins because I know people on the streets who might not live to see spring. I made a friend who used to sleep on the streets. I used to give clothes and food to him and his dog. One night he held my hand and proceeded to weep. He squeezed the hell out of my hand. I heard a couple bones crack and said, sorry. One night he held my hand and proceeded to weep and said, he don't know how long to live he has got. Now he told me that he lost his wife, lost his home and lost the life he used to have. And now he's on the streets and don't know what to try. That night, I remember telling him to keep strong. Now can I please have a moment of silence for him cause he's gone. Rest in peace, Patrick. Now, he had a kind heart and spoke politely too. He even offered me peace around Chinese food. And he told me he would die homeless and he did. So sometimes I sit and wonder, will my time be soon? Freezing cold and broken hearted. Yes, we're homeless, but not heartless. So what are we meant to think when they say, Home is where the heart is. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, All right, no more sadness. <laughs> I'm gonna try and actually this one's still a bit sad, but it's, it's like a <laughs> It's like a different kind of sad. Okay, this one's called Hope, and I haven't practiced it in such a long time, and I didn't expect to be reading it in front of you guys today. So please forgive any mistakes. Okay. There have been many troubled times that have caused me to lose my hope. Too weak to swim, prepared to drown, but first I choose to float in an icy cold, sorrow-filled river of my own tears. That sad, dark place with no glimmer of my hope there. I more my hope than begin to drown, sinking down. Then surprisingly, the hope that I just could not find somehow ends up finding me. Its peace revives the fight in me. It reignites the light in me. It realigns my eyes to see there's heaps of time and life in me, reminding me that there's times that we need some time to cry and ease the pain we feel before it tries to eat us up inside, then leave. Who knows about that kind of pain? I say all this while I hope better days will come to you. And while you go through testing times, I hope your hope will comfort you. Can you think back to a time where everything was going wrong? 
where it felt like the world was going to end and your hope was gone. It felt like the only company you had was your troubles. And the more you tried to get rid of them, they happened to double. And these troubles gave you times which were painful. They were spiteful and aimed to stifle and break you. But just when you thought that you lost it forever, your hope comes along to find you and save you. Now, years later, for all the pressure and stress, we're still here, heartbroken and bruised, but nevertheless, we're still here, which means that there's still maybe time for us to heal here, time for us to wisen up and find some love that's real here, the type of love that friends provide. When you need a little hope, the type of friends like yourself that will give and share their hope. They do this without considering how abundant hope is. They just want to give the ones they care about a little hope, which is the reason I wrote this and hope it helps my friends to cope. I hope it helps them through the rain, through the pain and sends them hope. If you're ever down, I hope what I wrote reminds you of your, if your hope is ever hard to find, relax, your hope will find you. Thank you. Standing ovation. Uh, that was so powerful. That was absolutely incredible. And your voice is amazing as well. As a radio person, I'm all about the voice. That was absolutely amazing. And it definitely amazing note to leave uh, this first section on the note of hope uh, and creativity um, and turning your pain into something beautiful. Um, so we have, we're, we're running slightly over time, so we have a 15 minute break now, um, and then we're going to be going into workshops uh, at 11.50, if my maths are right. Um, so uh, Miranda's going to talk you through which rooms the work rooms, workshops are in. Um, and for those joining you online, there's going to be an exclusive online only session um, to join at 11.50. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, Miranda is going to talk you through the workshops. Yeah, just very briefly, just to let you know where you're all going next. Uh, so over there, where I'm pointing at the back of the room, is workshop one, which is multiple disadvantage and community exploitation from Fulfilling Lives Lambeth, Southwark Lewisham. If you are in workshop two, it is just in the middle. You can't actually see it from here, but you can access it from either side. Um, and that workshop is the National Expert Citizens Group who share their learning from fulfilling lives. And then finally, if you're in workshop three, it's right here. And that one is Ripple Effect, a guide to systems change with fulfilling lives Southeast. Oh, and sorry, you can look in your pack, <laughs> which is uh, where you will find out which workshop you are in. Thank you. So, yeah. 15 minute break and back at 11.50. Thank you so much. <laughs>